This is an E! News special. Whitney Houston, Last Days of a Legend. Whitney's iconic voice is silent. I look to you. The legendary performer's tragic death, hours before music's biggest night. Miss Houston's body was pulled from the bathtub. A moment-by-moment -moment account. What happened that night inside the Beverly Hilton? You're not expecting to hear she can't make it. She's dead. Whitney Houston's final hours, a life cut too short. Then a look at the star's humble beginnings, her public battle with drugs, and her scandalous days with Bobby Brown. Plus... Oh my God, no! Her last performance. She loved what she did. And, um. The bizarre moment she crashed our interview. Come say hi to your godfather. Okay. And the outpouring of love from Hollywood. I don't even know what to say. I don't even have words at this point. I think everyone's kind of in shock. Everyone here has been affected by Whitney. I wouldn't be standing here. I feel like if it wasn't for her. She's the greatest singer I've ever heard. This is an E! News special. Whitney Houston, Last Days of a Legend. Hello, everyone. I'm Juliana Rancic. As the world says goodbye to Whitney Houston, unanswered questions still surround the pop icon's death. From her erratic behavior just days before she died to being seen with blood spots on her legs after what would be her final performance at a Hollywood nightclub. We start with exactly what happened in the troubling hours leading up to her death. E! News reporter Ken Baker with the timeline. Night before the greatest night in music. Watch out, Galloway! Hey, firm, guys, to the fourth floor. We were advised by Beverly Hills PD uh, that Miss uh, Houston had passed away. And so begins our journey through the icon's last hours and how the people that loved her told me, like, that when he died, I. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I just, I just saw her. Makeup artist Reginald Dowdley actually did her makeup on Thursday night before she went to the nightclub. She opened the door and she greeted me with a hug. Mrs. Houston, she mentioned that she was, you know, really excited to go to Clive Davis's party that Saturday night. Friday, late evening, Whitney is reportedly seen drinking in the lobby of the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Then, Saturday afternoon, the 48-year-old superstar settles in to take a bath before Clive's party. One of the first to learn something has gone awry is journalist Allison Samuels, who was on the first floor of the hotel waiting to interview Whitney. Tell me about Saturday. My interview was set to start at 4, but I was there at 3. They set everything up for Whitney, and her assistant um, came down, and she says, you know, Whitney is not going to be able to make it. Whitney can't get here, and then this is long pause, and she's like, Whitney's dead. At approximately 3.30 p.m., uh, Miss Houston was apparently discovered in her bathtub by a member of her personal staff. Miss Houston's body was pulled from the bathtub. When first responders arrived on scene, she was unconscious and unresponsive. First aid and CPR measures were performed in an attempt to revive her. They were unsuccessful, and at approximately 3.55 p.m. on Saturday, Whitney Houston was pronounced dead at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Did Whitney drown? Was it a lethal cocktail of prescription pills? The L.A. County coroner will not release cause of death until toxicology reports are complete. So while Houston's lifeless body is upstairs, Clive's party proceeds as planned. By now, sadly, you've all learned of the unspeakably tragic news of our beloved Whitney's passing. I don't have to mask my emotions, not in front of this room, full of so many dear friends. I've been going to this party for about 10 years, and let me tell you, this year, it was completely surreal. One second, Alicia Keys was doing a beautiful tribute to Whitney. The next minute, it was Neo and Pitbull on stage just rocking out, and it was a dance party. The thing about this red carpet is, I would usually ask about fashion and their upcoming projects, but no, we had to stick to Whitney. It's a tragedy because she's one of the greatest singers I ever heard in my life. Still trying to grasp the whole thing. We've been in like a state of shock. It is a sad night. Is this really real? And I feel like it's really, it's a really tragic thing. 12.30 a.m. The party is still going on at the same time Whitney's body is removed from her hotel room and transported to the morgue. 
Meanwhile, across town, the Grammys were just hours away. When we come back, producers scramble to overhaul the awards show. How a night of celebration quickly transformed into a heartbreaking event that the music world will never forget. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this E! News special, Whitney Houston, Last Days of a Legend. As soon as word spread that Whitney had passed away just hours before the Grammys, music's biggest night quickly turned from a party to a tearful tribute. Ken Baker picks up the story. It is now Sunday, the morning of the 54th Grammy Awards. Whitney Houston's death takes center stage. As soon as Grammy host LL Cool J and producers learned the stunning news, they knew what had to be done. We immediately had to jump in gear and try to figure out uh, how we could be respectful and you know, show her the love and the appreciation that she deserves and that her life warrants and merits. A daunting task. It's very hard to, to understand, I mean, from the producer's perspective, in a situation like this, you try to do the things you remember how to do when you're facing this kind of loss. That's the way it is when you lose someone yourself. That's the way it was when the musical community lost Whitney. Hours. Hours. 36 odd hours before the broadcast. Not even. Less than that. Very, very strange. Just hours before showtime, more bad news. Whit <laughs> Fox News captured video of Bobby Christina at LA Cedar Sinai Medical Center. She was later released. The mood? Somber. As stars gracefully hit this Grammy red carpet, putting on brave faces for the cameras. I don't even have words at this point. I think everyone's kind of in shock. My condolences go out to her and her family because she's definitely a true legend. She's the greatest singer I've ever heard. A great deal of sadness, but yet at the same time, I think there's a feeling of honor to respect and to honor uh, an incredible talent. I feel like, you know, that there is a little bit of a dark cloud, but I feel like it's sort of um, ironic because this is the night where instead of grieving, we can let music heal us and we can celebrate Whitney through music. There is no way around this. We've had a death in our family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sharing our sister Whitney with us. We remain truly blessed to have been touched by her beautiful spirit. Once inside, the same subdued energy was palpable. When the truly great artists leave us, their legacy lives on. I just want to say to Whitney up in heaven, we all love you, Whitney Houston. Emotional tributes were scattered all throughout the event, none more. She sang it in her key, she sang it her way. She's the closest thing we have now to what Whitney was and represented and is through her legacy in music. Whit it is wild because you were actually saying, Mark, I remember when we spoke to you live from the Grammys the next day, you were saying it was very surreal, the whole experience, because on one side of the room, you had people who were, you know, talking about Whitney and very emotional. On the other side, people are dancing and partying. It was just, all I keep saying is surreal. You can't, you know, people were texting me saying, are you, I've, I've gone to Clive's party probably now 10 to 15 years. And people were texting me going, are you at Clive's? I'm like, yep, and the body is four flights up. Uh, well, Ken, Mark, thank you so much. After the break, the early days of Whitney Houston, how an 18-year-old Whitney was first discovered by legendary music producer Clive Davis when this E! News special returns. Juliana Rancic back with you now for this E! News special. While Whitney's family, friends, and fans are still grieving the loss of this singer, we now take a look back at her remarkable journey to stardom. This is where Whitney Elizabeth Houston was born, Newark, New Jersey, August 9, 1963. Her father, John, was a talent manager. Her mother, Emily, was a gospel singer whose friends called her Sissy. Whitney was raised with strict Christian values and a passion for music. She was brought up in the African-American lifestyle of church, doing things as a family unit. Every Sunday morning, the family attended this church, where Sissy was the choir director. She loved music so much, she also formed a singing group called the Sweet Inspirations. The original members of the Sweet Inspirations were Sissy Houston, Sylvia Shemwell, Estelle Brown, and Myrna Smith. During the 1960s, the girls did background vocals for recording artists at Atlantic Records, including Sissy's niece, Dionne Warwick. 
everybody from Elvis Presley to Aretha Franklin really wanted to have Sissy Houston and the Sweet Inspirations back them up because they sounded so fabulous. And they ended up backing up Elvis Presley. Whitney was just five years old when her mother went on tour with the King. She really didn't want to leave us, you know, but she had to go. I remember all the hoopla about Elvis in Vegas, Elvis, and I was so proud that my mother was there with him, you know, because it was a very big event. Whenever her mother performed locally, the youngster loved to tag along. She grew up with music and musical stars all around her. 1975, Whitney had just turned 12 when she was asked to sing lead vocals at a Sunday church service. The congregation that day was astounded to hear Whitney at so, such a young age have such a powerful voice. Two years later, Whitney began singing backup for her mother's cabaret act. She admits that she was absolutely hooked on the applause and the smiles on people's faces when she sang. This one particular night, Sissy had Whitney do what people call a step out, which is where Whitney took a little bit of a solo in the middle of the song. And people were like, oh my God, who is that? Houston really wanted a singing career, but she had to wait. Sissy was pretty adamant that her children finish school and, you know, complete their education before they considered doing any, anything professionally in music. My mother's thing was, I know she's going to be a success. I know it. She's going to be very, very big. You know, she knew, you know, before I was thinking about it. So her, her concern was that uh, I didn't move too fast, that I, I, I had a, a childhood and a teenage years, and, and, and then by the time I was 18, if I decided to sign a contract, it was up to me. But when Houston got her first big break, it wasn't as a singer. Whitney was in Midtown Manhattan one day. She was spotted by a gentleman by the name of Dean Avedon, and he told her, I've got a friend who has a modeling agency. Her name is Frances Grill, and she's a click agency. He said, there's a great looking girl down in the lobby. I think you'll love her. And I came, I saw, left my desk and I went down the elevator real quick. And there she was, she was a beauty. And I said, yeah, you, absolutely, she should be a model. Houston signed a one-year contract and immediately went to work. The first one to book her in the, in the city was Seventeen Magazine. And they loved her and they booked her again and again. Whitney was one of the first African Americans to be on the cover of Seventeen and other fashion magazines. But she didn't seem happy about it. Music was her first love. I had a feeling that as she stayed in modeling, she was resentful and felt that it wasn't so easy because she was African American. Even though she made good money, 18-year-old Whitney quickly burned out on modeling. So she rejoined her mom's cabaret act. A local record executive caught the show one night and was totally blown away. I almost fell off my chair when I heard her sing. She had the talent and, and the poise of artists that had been singing for like, you know, 15, 20 years. Whitney's rendition of pop favorites and Broadway standards sent Griffith racing backstage after the set. I said to her, I want you to be with us at Arista Records, and I'm going to see Clive tomorrow and tell him what I saw tonight. Griffith arranged for a private showcase with legendary music executive Clive Davis. Clive just went bananas. I mean, he said, we've got to have this girl. <laughs> In April 1983, Whitney signed a one-year contract with Arista Records. One month later, the 19-year-old singer made her television debut. You know, it wasn't just black, it wasn't just white, it wasn't just pop, it wasn't just R&B. It was like everybody. Clive wanted a pop diva from, them from day one. It was clear what he wanted, and all he needed was a talent. In February 1985, Whitney released her self-titled debut album and the buzz began to build. Clive Davis really had it in his mind that Whitney was a ballad singer, and that first album is filled with them. Whitney Houston was something unique. Yeah, she truly was an amazing talent, huh? Well, after the break, the moment Whitney Houston became a superstar, her very first hit song, and the movie that was actually put on hold to make sure that she could take the leading role when this E! News special returns.
back now with our E! News special. It is hard to believe, but it was 27 years ago when Whitney Houston's self-titled debut album hit store shelves and the world discovered her astonishing voice. Whitney Houston was like Cinderella. It was like watching a fairy tale. She was the beautiful princess who could do no wrong in the recording business. Houston's first single, Saving All My Love For You, was an instant classic. Whitney's album was released in February, and by August it had sold over a million copies in America. Whitney was well on her way to superstardom. In June 1987, Houston released her second album. Simply titled Whitney, the record debuted at number one and produced four huge hits. If you look at Whitney's career in the late 80s, everything she touched turned to gold and platinum. She was a success all around the world. The 27-year-old singer mesmerized viewers when she performed the Star Spangled Banner at the 1991 Super Bowl. That last note that so few people can hit when they sing the Star Spangled Banner, she got everyone away. Houston's charisma caught the attention of actor Kevin Costner. He wanted her to co-star in his new film, The Bodyguard. I postponed the movie a year to wait for Whitney because I thought it was that important to this particular movie. The combination of Whitney's natural presence and never having been in a movie created a realism when she stood up and said, I'm up. It was intense, you know. I tried not to be overwhelmed. But I just wanted to do the best I could and be as comfortable as possible, you know. Whitney sang six songs on the movie soundtrack, including a dramatic ballad that became Houston was just getting started as an actress. In 1995, she returned to the big screen in Waiting to Exhale. This was more of an ensemble piece. She says it really felt closer to that character. Whatever happened to the good old days oh. when men actually flirted with you and, and asked you all for a real date, you know? Where they hide? Waiting to Exhale did quite well and also showed a side of her that maybe other people hadn't seen. The following year, Whitney co-starred in The Preacher's Wife with veteran actor Denzel Washington and her mom, Sissy. She's the organist of the church, you know, and you know, usually they're very opinionated, you know, and it was just cool to kind of like do the role reversal thing because I'm playing her and she's playing someone in the choir. It was very, very moving for the both of us. Houston was inspired by another family member, husband Bobby Brown, when she recorded her 1998 album, My Love Is Your Love. Whitney said he's the king of hip hop and not only a personal partner, but as somebody who she can kind of run creative ideas past as well. Then, after a long absence, Whitney returned to the recording studio in 2009 with a new album called I Look To You. I had other plans to live on this little island and, you know, open a food stand and call it a day, but, you know, I got this call from Clive and he said, well, no, that's not, <laughs> this is not, it's not what you're going to do. Do you consider this a comeback? No. I've been back. Y'all just catching up. <laughs> Kind of an interesting point, Whitney's shooting down the talk of a comeback, but it seems the world was once again ready for the star to make another so-called comeback. Ken Baker and Mark Malkin join me again uh, with more to talk about this. So, Mark, what was going on in Whitney's life as far as her career was concerned? You know, people were really excited about her acting career. You know, she, she just wrapped a Sparkle with Jordan Sparks. They mm -hmm. shot it in Detroit. She was on time. She was clean. She was sober. She was professional. She was even spotted going to church when they weren't filming. Mm -hmm. People were really excited this was going to be her comeback in the movie world. And she sings in the movie. She sings in the movie. And, you know, as we know, her voice wasn't the same.
Right, because Ken, it, it wasn't the same. A lot of fans, they, well, when they would hear her sing, they would kind of like really hope that, oh God, I hope she hits those notes. I hope her voice comes back. And it was pretty raspy through the, the past 10 years or so. Yeah, well, Whitney had this incredible vocal range. I mm -hmm. mean, from low to the high. And I mean, a lot of people thought that range was almost cut in half by the end of her career. And, and I think that this was something that was an ongoing issue for her. I just saw an interview recently with Shaka Khan, and she basically said, look, she should have had throat surgery. They can do surgery now to open up the throat, to get polyps off, things like that. But Whitney wouldn't do it. Uh, and so there was a lot of concern over her voice, but it wasn't anything new, Juliana. I mean, you go back to, let's say, 2009, 2010, she was getting booed off the stage for a tour that she was doing to support her album that she had come out with. And so people were really starting to notice it. But you can go back to as early as 2000. I remember personally being in Las Vegas, and I watched a show that she was doing. It was a mm -hmm. joint performance with her and Bobby Brown and the crowd was uh, getting restless they were asking her to sing her hits there were songs that Whitney wouldn't do because she was uh, apparently just too challenged you know she was afraid and intimidated yeah. to try to pull off some of her hits and so this was an issue and this would go on throughout the next decade her trying to mount comebacks but her voice her vocal range was so limited by them all right thank you so much and we'll see you back here in a few minutes but right now how Whitney's rise to fame caused some major problems with her relationship with Bobby Brown Welcome back to Whitney Houston, Last Days of a Legend. In the early 1990s, the good girl who grew up singing in a gospel choir met bad boy R&B star Bobby Brown, and they quickly became the music industry's most talked about twosome. Whitney and Bobby were definitely a hot couple, hot in love. They had something very special at that time. In 1992, 29-year-old Whitney did the unimaginable. She made an honest man out of Brown. I actually married me. She said, she looked at the ring and she was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. You know, kiss me. And I said, you sure? Whitney and Bobby had another reason to celebrate when their daughter, Bobby Christina, was born on March 4th, 1993. She had several miscarriages and always wanted to be a mother. You know, in my interviews with her, she talks about motherhood and wanting to feel that bond with a child. I bring my life with me, which is my daughter. I keep her with me as much as I can, as much as I can. And my husband and I try to maintain the fact and try to make sure that when I'm on tour, he's home. Meanwhile, as Houston's fame grew, Brown's began to dim. He was always in her shadow. When they hooked up, he was never her peer. Ever since Bobby married Whitney, he's been looking for a hit record as big as any of her hits and has not been able to achieve it. Brown lashed out. In April 1995, Bobby was arrested in Orlando for allegedly punching a nightclub patron. He was charged with aggravated battery and disorderly conduct, but charges were later dropped. Bobby has had problems with the law. That's not a secret. Even though Bobby and Whitney were supposedly happily married, incidents of Bobby womanizing, starting fights over women in clubs, chasing other women, were well reported in the press. Tabloids loved him. Substance abuse, fights, DUI. It was a contrast to what Whitney appeared to be, which was this pristine, beautiful, perfect person. Brown's wild ways got the best of him. In October 1995, Bobby checked into an alcohol rehab center and Houston lent her support. Her friends tell me that she wanted that marriage to work and she was willing to do whatever it took to make it work. It hurt her reputation. Eventually, we found out that she was into a lot of that stuff as well. It seemed that she began to be affected by all the craziness surrounding Bobby Brown. Her behavior was erratic. She was acting out. She wasn't reliable anymore. In 2000, Houston was caught trying to bring a half ounce of marijuana onto a plane in Hawaii. She pled no contest to misdemeanor charges, which were eventually dropped. Two months later, Whitney was invited to perform at the Oscars, but her rehearsal was stormy. Probably one of the most telling performances or non-performances Whitney gave was year 2000 Academy Awards. She had no voice, couldn't seem to remember the lyrics to Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and was asked to leave. For the next few years, Bobby and Whitney stayed out of the spotlight. 
Then in 2005, they reemerged in a reality television show called Being Bobby Brown. Damn! Damn! You better get makeup. I just want a real life. Lord, I just want to be a real person. The idea came basically from my kids and then the producers that I work with came to me with it. Being on TV is a privilege, you know? And they usually put me on TV for, you know, stupid stuff. But um, I just miss it. I miss the business, so... Here I am. <laughs> he wanted to do it. I, I was like, mm. Being Bobby Brown kind of exposed Whitney for who she really was, and the public didn't necessarily appreciate that. It was kind of opposite of what we thought she was like. The show's failure added to the stress at home. Rumors circulated about a possible separation. I think the tipping point for her was that he didn't change. He kept doing the same thing. He, he kept sort of dating outside of the marriage. He hanging out. We're just trying to be better for each other. And I'm... Um, we gonna get there. Bobby was mistaken. Whitney moved out of the couple's Atlanta home in spring 2006 and filed for divorce that September. If you watched the show, if you read reports, it wasn't surprising at all because it was, at this point, a pretty toxic union. At the end, I think it was devastating. She filed for divorce, but I don't think she ever got over it. Straight after the break, Whitney Houston falls from grace. The moment the world first found out she was on drugs and her turbulent road to try and get sober. When our E-News special returns. Welcome back to Whitney Houston, Last Days of a Legend. Behind Whitney's confident smile and that powerful voice was a woman who was powerless in her fight with addiction. The year 2000 was a rough one for Whitney. The news broke of her having marijuana in her purse at an airport in Hawaii. And that's what kind of started this whole we didn't really know Whitney was super into that type of stuff. In April, she did the taping for the Arista special and appeared very, very disoriented. For the May shooting of Jane magazine, public reports of her being high or on something were circulating in the papers. Whitney addressed the rumors of her alleged drug use during a taping of Primetime Live. Houston uttered the now infamous phrase, we don't do crack, crack is whack. Whitney Houston is super talented but she's also self-destructive. Whitney claims to have throat problems. People close to Whitney have told me her throat problems stem from cocaine use, the burning out and failure of vocal cords. What I've learned through the years is we can't want to save someone more than they want to save themselves. In March 2004, Houston finally admitted that she had a problem and checked into rehab, but stayed for only five days. The problem when you see someone as a celebrity being sent into rehab is they're not in there long enough. We went to the rehab center around 10 or 11 at night and we went high. It was always high and we gave excuses for giving urine. It was basically just a joke. Houston's troubled relationship with Bobby Brown just added to the problem. Whitney's behavior is an outgrowth of the disappointment of the grief or whatever emotions she may have regarding her husband's situation. He was in jail. So I'm sure a lot of that would put a person under a great deal of stress. When you talk about Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown, you're talking about a lot of substance abuse issues. There were violence issues. Just about every issue that can come between a good marriage. They had some happy times. They had hits. They had a beautiful child together. But in the end, their own demons did them in. Whitney returned to rehab in March 2005, then filed for divorce the following year. The separation gave her an opportunity to heal. She traveled, bonded with the daughter, all the things that you would do when you're turning over new leads. And I think it worked for a while, but when that stuff gets a hold of you sometimes, it's really hard to let it go. Relapse is huge. The longer in addiction that you've lived in the disease, the harder it is to get sober. But the key is that each time you relapse that you run right back to treatment. Houston's longtime mentor, Clive Davis, offered his support. Clive has definitely put forth efforts to mm -hmm. help her recover. Yes. But she has got to accept that responsibility. She has got to look in the mirror and say, wow, look at what I've done to my life. In 2009, Whitney opened up during an interview with Oprah Winfrey. 
she admitted smoking marijuana laced with cocaine and shared her difficult journey towards sobriety. Staying clean was a challenge for Houston. Addiction is a disease. It is a lifelong process, something that has to be right in front of your face 24-7. By late 2011, Whitney seemed happy, healthy, and ready to return to the big screen. She executive produced and starred in a remake of the 1976 film Sparkle. The movie is set to premiere this August. From all accounts, everyone says she was great in it, enjoyed her time with it. For people who saw her as recently as November on the set and said she was so rejuvenated, so excited about being in the mix again. People like to see somebody who can recover from some really bad life choices and bad circumstances. Bad choices and bad circumstances, that may well define what ultimately was Whitney's downfall. As the star is laid to rest in her home state of New Jersey, there are still so many unanswered questions. So we're going to turn again to Ken Baker and Mark Malkin. So Mark, how do you think people will remember her, Ken? Well, I, I think it's going to be a mixture of two things primarily. One, artistic genius, a voice of a kind that we never had heard before. The voice that everyone talks about. Right. That's, and, and, you know, but to have that conversation without giving thought to her personal life and her troubles. And she had a very, um, just a complicated personal life. I think that time will tell how much of that personal struggle will be tied into the legacy of her voice and her career achievements. We ought to talk about something because obviously sales of her albums and songs are going to skyrocket. So who will end up making money off of all of these album sales? I think a lot of people are assuming that Whitney Houston's estate is going to be getting all the money. Well, it's not because Whitney didn't write the songs. Mm. The writers, the producers, and the label. They're the ones who are going to make the money. Right, like I Will Always Love You is a Dolly Parton Dolly, song. Dolly Parton is going to make a fortune out of this. Yeah. Then, of course, you have to realize there's all this footage of her that's going to be remastered. There's going to be compilation DVDs. Mm -hmm. I think come holiday time, we're going to see the best of Whitney Houston uh, concerts, the best of Whitney Houston music. So there's going to be a lot of money that the label is going to make on this. I think a good model for this, for probably for the estate, is going to be Michael Jackson, frankly. I mean, he has become way more valuable in his death than in the last years of his life. The same thing happened with Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe. Right. So I think what, to Mark's point, I think you're going to see a lot of albums, you're going to see a movie about her life and development, books, you name it, and I think there's going to be a lot of revenue streams uh, you know, to make money off of her legacy. But the question is, where is that money going to go? Is it Bobby Christina? Is it Bobby Brown? Is it her family? I mean, no well, one we knows don't know, that, right? We don't know yet what her will stated, uh, mm -hmm. who was her, the uh, uh, the beneficiaries right. of her fortune. And, and we don't even know how big her fortune was. But I think at the end of the day, we know that she was a great artist. She was one of a kind. And either way, She's missed today, and she's going to be missed for some time to come. Absolutely. Well said. Well, thank you both so much. Ken Baker, Mark Malkin, thank you so much for your insights today. Well, when we return, Whitney Houston, the legend, is remembered. Welcome back to Whitney Houston, Last Days of a Legend. E has followed Whitney's amazing and sometimes troubled life since the very start of her career. And now we're going to leave you with a final look at Whitney Houston as we remember her. It's an indescribable feeling. You know, it's like a surge of energy. It's like um, just taking off and just flying. I am so happy to see my mother my dear cousin Dion, I, I am so proud. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. You overwhelm me. God bless you. I'm still as excited as I was on the first year I came here. I mean, it's it's just great to know that people still enjoy you, you know, and that you haven't uh, gotten old and tired. <laughs> I'm having fun. Whenever you saw Whitney, she always hit you with that beautiful smile. She always hit you with that incredible energy. She gave you that hug that just shook your body, that real love. Whitney Houston, simply put, had the greatest voice in the world. Something happens when you're singing.
Think about just how much this person has, has touched your life. <laughs> I'm talking about Whitney, yeah. And I'd be like, oh, I want to dance with somebody. I'm a lover of good melody, good music, great standards, great songs that will live in the hearts of people for a long time. If you have to deal with the other side, talk about how she ended. She ended her last big CD. Looking to God, I look to thee. I look to you. I thank God that I've been blessed enough to have the kind of fame and fortune, you know, that uh, people dream of. You know, I am. I'm, I'm blessed, and that's how I take it as a blessing.